Um, so welcome everybody to the Open Data Institute. Thanks for coming on this rather grim um, day. Um, and hello to everyone on the live stream. Um, so yeah, we're here today to talk about data portability, um, which broadly speaking is the ability to share data between people, groups of people and organizations. But we often hear about it in a personal data context um, and especially in the context of GDPR. Um, but data portability more broadly is something we've been working on at the ODI for a while. Um, we were leaders in the kind of open banking movement um, in the UK and has really established the UK as a leader on that front. Um, so something we're quite proud of here. Um, and we've looked at prospects for data portability in industries like telecoms and peer-to-peer um, -peer accommodation and more recently the energy sector. Um, so at the ODI, we're using um, innovative techniques to try and pick this apart. Um, so we're doing things like computational modeling and um, even things like design fiction. So imagining different futures, both utopic and dystopian. Um, so yeah, we're really, really grateful to Liz to come and speak to all of those themes. Um, she is the CEO <coughs> of Control Shift. Um, which is a market analyst and consulting business that's focused on the personal information economy. Um, Liz has 20 years of consulting experience specializing in digital interactions between businesses and consumers. Um, and she's here today to present um, the analysis um, contained in a report that was commissioned by DCMS, um, which is on the economic opportunities <coughs> Um, for the UK of um, this kind of mobility and personal data um, and then thinking through what the challenges are around that and also how we do it in a trustworthy way. Um, so yeah, thanks very much to Liz for coming. Um, if I can ask um, for you to leave questions until the end, um, just so you can use the microphone so that the people who are watching on the live stream can hear you. Um, and to everyone who's watching on the live stream, if you can use the hashtag ODI Fridays, so that's capital O, capital D, capital I Fridays, um, on Twitter to ask questions, and then we'll pick them up in the Q&A. Um, so yeah, without further ado, over to you, Liz. Thank you Great, thank you very much, and uh, thanks very much to the ODI for inviting me to speak. And indeed, thank you very much for turning up on, as you said, a fairly grim day. We are obviously, there's a form of insanity in this room, which uh, we mustn't talk to anybody about. Um, OK, so yes, I'm Liz Brandt. I'm co-founder and chief executive of Control Shift. We're a business innovation consultancy specialising in strategic value of trusted personal data. We work with organisations all over the world. Uh, a lot of large organisations, governments, regulators, um, infrastructure providers, and more. Uh, I won't go into what we, what we do for them all right now, because we're here to talk about what we've termed data mobility. Um, and you'll find the report, which is now published, having got released, um, having made its way through the Brexit communications plan to land on the, uh, the gov.uk website. You can find it there or on our website, indeed. Um, it is a 200-page tome, um, but there is a 20-page summary on our website, so if you can have a look, it's there. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through the why, the what, economic opportunities, challenges and core issues, enablers in the marketplace, what we recommended to government, and some of the opportunities for business. Okay, so why? Why did DCMS, which is actually the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, um, why did they commission it? So they wanted to have a look at the opportunity for data portability as a growth opportunity for the UK economy because in our digital um, charter, we are, as the UK are looking for us to be the safest place to be online, the best place to start and grow a business and be the world's most innovative economy, social, um, and, and to spread the social and economic benefits fairly around our society. The subtle change of the colour behind tells you these are not necessarily the best things that we're trying to, to... These are the things we're trying to avoid. So we're trying to avoid or overcome some of the large concentrations of data, which denies access to uh, critical data. 
for many organisations. And then without that, we can't get access to uh, many of the benefits and they're definitely constrained to some of the organisations that have those huge um, concentrations of data. And uh, looking again at Wendy Hall's uh, AI review, um, that also constrains our ability to access the future economic opportunities in AI and machine learning and build out the skills that uh, we will all need into our digital futures. Um, so what we were doing is looking at this market and, as I say, look for the economic opportunities, the, um, uh, the, the enablers and uh, where do we go next. So we researched it looking and talking to a large number of leading experts around the world looked at over 100 papers um, and over 100 market and uh, 50 market initiatives. That's why the paper is so long. There's about half of it as appendices. So if you're really interested in this subject, then there's loads of references to all the papers we looked at. Um, we also did an economic analysis. So we had economists look at uh, what the opportunity actually is, which is the first time this has really been looked at from an economic perspective. And I'll talk to that in a minute. Uh, and they were looking very much at what is the business and economic opportunity, but also what are the societal, societal opportunities. And in all of our work in the last nine years as a business, both of those things are really important. And what we're finding is it's not just now important for government to think about those broader um, opportunities, but for businesses as well who are taking an increased interest in the societal interest, uh, societal opportunities had an underlying um, analysis of 18, sorry, uh, we did a piece of market analysis. We identified 18 underlying key challenges, and I'll talk to those, which we then summarised down and, and analysed down into five key issues, which helped us to identify how we or the government could, could drive this market forward. And we used design to start to pull some of that apart and look at how do we actually move this market forward. So what is the question here? Um, I hope you can see this at, at home, s s rather detailed actually, but what we're trying to look at here is what have we currently got? What is data portability and why is data mobility different? So in, a data pool, a de in the current world, which we have been building up for an awfully long time, we've got personal data shared with tacit consent and we all know that. There's the I've pressed the button, I've bought the app and Cambridge Analytica's got my data and then interesting things happen. And that's happening absolutely everywhere. And probably everybody in this room, anybody who's watching, knows exactly what that is and what the problems is that that, that creates. Data portability, really important right, a really important right in GDPR that individuals have the right to data. Has anybody actually implemented data portability? I was with a, a media company this week. They had five data portability requests since May. Uh, very exciting. Uh, they're big. So no, not really. And um, I was with a telco company last week. Uh, if they're asked for data portability, they will give you name, home address and telephone number, all of which you could probably have guessed before. Um, so what is data portability? What is what is the data that's going to share? So although it's a human right, it has we've got we've very little, little definition around it to make it into a useful uh, right. Um, and data portability, so that looks at how do you get that data from, an from the organisation to an individual and potentially then to another organisation should, should you want to, to do that. Data, port data mobility rather, the vision for data mo mobility is that it becomes mobile rather than just portable. So it goes from mo multiple organisations to multiple organisations via the individual and more importantly, the, the data facilitator in the, in the centre. And I know the ODI is doing a lot of work on uh, trust hubs and in, we've been looking at this for quite some time. There's a huge market of people looking at this particular central uh, facilitating capability. And that is what we're looking at in data mobility. Just to go back to data portability, we're saying that data portability is actually half-baked. And I said before, you know, what data can you get? It's not just what data can you get, but how can you get hold of it? What structures does it come in? Is it useful when it gets to you? And who, importantly, who do you share it with and who do you not share it with? How do people know? So <clears throat> if, for instance, Joe Shady was to set up a very sparkly website that said, if you give me all your data, I'll give you 100 quid, 
then there's probably a lot of people in this country who would do that and would feel no qualms about doing it. It's probably very ill-advised because that data could be used to empty bank accounts, thieve their identity and generally cause chaos in their lives. So it's creating hazards for the individual, but it's also creating hazards for businesses and they're very concerned about it. They're very relieved there's only five people asking for it, but they're very relieved, very, very worried because for a brand, who, wherever, rightly or wrongly, what is perceived by the market is that if the data is shared from a brand mm. to an individual and the individual becomes damaged or you know, has a, a disadvantage from it, it's the brand's fault. Now, whether that's right or not, that is the perception at the moment and that is what will happen. Lots of companies, we've done research with, for lots of companies, lots of companies have done research themselves. It lands back with them. It is their responsibility. And yet there are no safety rails to stop that from happening. It's not actually something they can have an influence over. So there's a great deal of concern about that particular element of GDPR. Okay, so um, thus we look at data mobility as a way of looking at how do we resolve that and how do we put in place some of the safety rails and the capabilities to actually help that be not just available but safe and valuable. Okay, so what are the opportunities? There is in the report a complete copy of the Economist's report. Anybody an economist in this room? Okay, so, uh -huh, okay, well, you'll definitely understand it. Um, took me a little while, um, but we got there. So what does it do? It avoids, if we, if we implement data mobility, it will avoid market concentrations and improve healthy and competitive markets. Very important for government, but also very important for organisations. And those organisations that currently hold huge concentrations of data, you'll see they're coming under quite a battering about their competitive markets and whether their markets are healthy or not, and that's a big concern for them. If we put in place the, the capabilities, we will also create an opportunity for 21st century digital infrastructure. And this is an infrastructure that we can create for our own country and our own people and our own businesses, but will be exportable and capable for use elsewhere. So it creates a huge opportunity in the marketplace. <clears throat> Actually using the data, uh, the economists have looked at uh, where, where the opportunities are. There are two massive opportunities. One is, well, you could say three, but let's just bundle productivity and efficiency together. 27.8 uh, billion productivity and efficiency opportunity in the UK economy. I don't know whether anybody's looked at how productive or efficient we are as businesses in the UK versus elsewhere, but we're lagging massively behind internationally in our productivity. Um, so this is a big thing for government to look at how do we enable businesses to become more productive. It's also very big for businesses to try and catch up. There is also what, what the economists call recombinant innovation. So and it took me quite a while to get this one, but I've now got, it's not reclining innovation, it's recombinant innovation. So recombining of data data that's never been seen together before to create new services and new value. Um, so apparently this is an economics term which comes from a lot in manufacturing where you might take the same parts that you create one car with and recombine them to, to make another car, another, another model, for instance, but it happens across the piece in many industries. So recombinant is a well-known economic opportunity the difficulty is how do you actually size a recombinant innovation opportunity around data when you actually, in many instances, don't even know what the data is that's out there. So this is a big opportunity. Um, it's certainly an awful lot bigger than productivity and efficiency. Additionally, though, and this is, you know, there's a lot of businesses now, and thanks to the ODI, you know, we've got open banking and we've got banks who actually understand this market very, very well. They see this as absolutely a foundation for, for, the, for the next growth in our economy and our digital economy moving forward, as do many other businesses. I've talked about media, I've talked about telco, they're all looking for this, uh, the, certainly the digital economy, but for this to be a vital stimulus for growth into the future. I am not going to read the 18 key challenges 
you can find them in the report. And when you found them, you can tell me which page it's on. Um, but there are 18 key challenges. They break down into five core issues. Those core issues are interwoven. Those challenges are interwoven and the core issues are interwoven, which makes this quite a challenging market to, to actually develop. So if I start from the top, consumer know-how. Consumer know-how is about understanding and, um, and understanding the market, but also understanding data and what's going on with data. How much do we need to know to make ourselves safe? How much do we need to know to actually make it valuable for us is a big question. And, I, and we see that that's actually going to be quite a, a shifting market because in the same way that a medical market, you need to know, years ago, you needed to know not to take any old stuff off the street that was supposed to, supposedly medicine. Now you don't really need to know an awful lot because there's all the checks and balances already in the market to make sure that the medicine, by and large, that reaches you is actually safe. But we haven't got those checks and balances in our digital market. And we haven't got those checks and balances in our, in our data market. So how much do we need to know? How much can we expose consumers to? There's a lot of people working on this, and this is certainly something that's very important for government to start to facilitate and move forward. And I can see some smiling faces in the audience on that one, but I will move on. Um, consumer services and applications. Certainly the consumer services to actually access the data, use the data, are currently nascent, I would say. There are a lot, we've got a big network of applications and services. There are a lot who are, who are trying to develop these things. Lots of them are one man and a mouse, but there are some that have got very significant funding and are really moving forward and have built out some very significant technology to make this happen. That's just the, the, the data facilitator, the enabler in the middle. There are also a lot of services out there who are looking to do <coughs> that recombinant innovation, who are looking for that data that is recombined and accessible. Um, so they're, they're, you know, they're, in, they're looking at help me manage my health, help me manage my money, help me manage my travel, help me manage my home, help me manage my husband. No, not that one. Um, that's actually impossible, even with recombined data. Anyway, so <laughs> my poor husband comes in for a lot of, a lot of stick. Anyway, uh, infrastructure and standards, big gig. And we see this as a major enabler for this market. And we'll look a little bit more at some of the things that are inside that in a, in a mo. Um, but certainly common technologies, common standards, these are all the things the ODI have been working on, things that lots of companies have been working on to try and draw together. British Standards Institute, British Computer Society, ISO, Kantara, there's a whole bunch of people working on standards. There's huge amounts of work going into this. But what we're seeing is a lot of that is actually not coordinated at all. So there's a coordination role that's required here. Adaptive regulation, really important. When we talk to businesses, they're very scared that regulators are going to come in and just dump great big lumps of regulation all over the market which has happened before, and MySpace died on the back of that in the UK, and Facebook flourished. So they're very concerned that they're going to make massive investments and the regulators are going to come in and just dump stuff on top of it. Now, I can tell you that the regulators and government are really interested in how to be more adaptive about how they go through this market. It's a massively changing market and will continue to change. So how do they actually regulate for it? They're always behind the curve. They're always behind the curve, so how do they keep up? Businesses are really keen to work with regulators to develop it, but they still don't know quite how they do that and still hold the line, so to speak. But they're working on it, which is good news. And the rather odd sounding one at the bottom, which is uh, certainly a core issue, which is the business case. So with all of those things that go on above here and the other four core issues, most businesses can identify every single risk you like around an, and problem and cost around doing this, but they can't see, just like the economists, how big is this opportunity. So when you can see the costs, but you can't actually see and measure the costs and risks, but you can't actually see and measure the opportunity, you can't make a business case. You can't make a business case to your chief executive to release the data to participate in this market. So we've got a real Gordian knot in all of this. You haven't got the demand from consumers. You haven't got a business case for, for, from businesses. Therefore, you can't invest in the infrastructure because there's no, there's no case for it. So where, where do we go? There is a need for intervention and there is a market failure in all of this. 
So, on the happier side, <laughs> uh, there are lots of enablers, and I've, I've talked a bit about some of them already. Open banking is a massive enabler. We are way ahead of the market, very much thanks to all the hard work that Gavin and the ODI put in years ago with uh, the, the big banks. Um, we are, people still think we're 18 months ahead. They've already created much of the rails to actually make this happen, but just in banking. How do we abstract that and make it generic? I mentioned earlier on there are also lots of services out there. We call them personal information management services, but also personal data management services who are already, there are a huge number of them, a huge number in the UK, lots to do with open banking, but also lots to do with my data many years ago, which Nigel was also involved, Nigel Shabbat was also involved in with us. So we are, we are seen as a leading market. Um, and as I said earlier on, there's a huge number of standards activities a lot around interoperability, which is one of the key infrastructure challenges, standard challenges, interoperability of data. Um, masses, go and have a look at the report. It's a huge number of them. Shocking, actually. Um, uh, emergent solutions um, that can be built on, there's lots of them. We looked at all sorts. Uh, uh, if you looked at India Stack, you looked at Crossroads, you looked at Blue Button in America, Green Button in America. There's huge numbers of activities all across the world, all at various stages, all struggling with different things. India Stack's currently struggling with the whole privacy and trust issue. They've built out all the technology and gone, oh, hang on a second, we forgot about that privacy and trust thing. Um, so we're all running at it, and I think there's huge opportunity to pull that together and work out what, what can we learn and what can we build on. But the development is uncoordinated, uncoordinated, as I said, and investment is very spread, although I would say that people are starting to become very um, aware of what needs to be invested in. A huge amount of investment is actually starting to pour into the market, which is really great news. I mean, a year ago, you'd have to have blockchain written next to it if you wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> but that's kind of a bit of a fad. Nowadays, people are saying they're getting huge investment and, and great interest from um, private equity and VCs and uh, and a lot of individuals investing in the market. And as I said earlier on, safe data sharing, this thing about is it safe to share the, the data from an organisation to an individual and then on to an or, an, another organisation, this is a gap. We haven't found anybody that's addressed this gap. So it, it's currently live uh, in GDPR and there's nothing to actually sort it out. I talked about the infrastructure and standards, so I, pulled, I wanted to pull out four here as, as four key pieces of infrastructure that are needed. And I'll come back to digital identity in a second, but interoperability, the ability to use data from one organisation to the hard, even in finance, to go Barclays data, HSBC data, Barclays data, NHS, even harder. So how do we make that work? That's definitely a challenge, but there are lots of people working on it. Safe data sharing, I've also talked about as a piece of infrastructure. How do we make that happen? And liability models. So we talk about brand issues. We talk about the issue of somebody being harmed by sharing their data. But who picks up the liability for that? If my bank account gets hacked because I've done something with my data, is it my responsibility? And therefore, do I lose all that overdraft that I've got in my bank account, oh shame. Um, or do I, or does the bank pick it up? Because in the past, the bank would have picked that liability up, but actually it's us now. And where does that liability sit? And is it me, or is it, can I make the liable liability the end, the end organisation? Who is the end organisation, and can I identify them, and can I find them? So there's a huge question here, and there's, there's lots of talk about that becoming an insurance market. So how do we insure, either individually and as organisations? around that liability issue. I'll come back to identity, I left it b deliberately behind because, because actually it's ahead. So uh, you'll all have known of that Verify, I should think, in the UK. Um, the UK government um, sponsored a digital identity activity, which has got another, I think, 16 months to run. There's talk of that opening up into a much broader market. In the meantime, the broader market is cracking on. And you might have seen this week that Microsoft and MasterCard have announced that they are going to collaborate on a digital identity. Will their brand persist in that market and, and enable them? Who knows? I'm old enough to remember when Microsoft had a, had a go before. I think it was 2002 or 2003. Nobody liked the brand. Nobody wanted them to own their digital identity. 
And, and you know, will, will that be a digital identity to rule them all or will there be a digital identity to rule them all? Will you let MasterCard have your digital identity that enables you access to the NHS? Or would you want somebody else to do that? Would you, would you be happy for that to use that to get into a bank? Possibly, but would you be happy for that to get into, as I say, health data? Possibly not. So although there are players who are really strong in this market now, and we really have some live solutions in the market, there, there's still quite a way to go. And, and by the way, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about digital identity here is an identity which you can have and hold and share as you arrive, not your digital identity when you arrive at a bank and they say, give me all your information, we'll use it to identify you in, in the bank. And then again at Telco, and then again, and then again at the bank again. Hmm. Anyway, I'm not going back to user journey issues. Um, so what we see, though, is in all of these areas, there is going to be significant progress in the next three years. Just go to the safe data sharing for a second. We're about to kick off in January a project on safe data sharing with a number of companies, including, if you've seen the data transfer project that Facebook, Google, Twitter and LinkedIn, Microsoft are, are pulling together, that's how do they transfer data. So those entities are bringing their skills and knowledge from that project. Bank, um, a media company, a telco company, an energy company collaborating together to experiment on how do we actually create these, this, this safe data sharing. We're bringing some of the data facilitators in to see if they actually are what they say they are. Let's see how we go. So our government recommendations, <coughs> threefold. So one is create a data mobility coordinating entity. It's, we're back to how do government and businesses collaborate. They need to pull together a number of entities that will collaborate to actually help drive, shape and drive this market. It has to be, it's a bit like Open Banking Working Group, but it has to be empowered, independent, have the money, have some teeth. Open Banking Working Group had the CMA, I think, behind it at the time. So actually we had the ability to make, make it painful, I think, for the businesses who didn't collaborate. I think that's how it works. Um, so, so there's the coordinating entity. Then there's to progress priority infrastructure to key challenges. So for governments, one of their, there's two key things they need to do. They need to make sure we are safe and that, that it's easy for markets to operate. So we are, an infrastructure enables that, enables it to be safe, it enables the market to be easy. Um, and that is what they need to start driving. They need to start driving standards, um, uh, individual know-how and that adaptive regulation core issue. In the meantime, please leave the value alone because that's what businesses drive. So don't try dabbling in creating value, try focusing on the infrastructure. I'm not saying the NHS doesn't. That's, a, that's, that's not why we call government as such. The NHS can obviously look at how do they use data to create value, but certainly as a core, core government, central government unit, um, they should be focusing on the infrastructure. However, because of this Gordian knot of business value, risk, cost, there is a need to facilitate businesses to come together to overcome the key challenges that, um, that they face. So we're looking, we're asking government to facilitate organisations to come together to look at those specific key challenges. I'm really pleased because the report has, although it took a long time to um, publish, it is actually having quite an impact on a, different, a lot of different activities in government. Uh, we've been asked to contribute to the Treasury's uh, Digital Competitive Market Review, if anybody's seen that. Um, it's a really interesting review with some very significant people advising it, looking at how do we deal with digital markets, especially platform-based businesses, and, um, and enabling competitive and healthy markets. There's a Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, which everybody probably knows around already, but it is still doesn't have a brand yet, it's that new. It had its inaugural board meeting last week and um, is a really big step forward and very impressive group of people driving that forward. Competitions Market Authority, obviously very interested in how do we use data to make the markets competitive. Bayes, or Department for Business, Energy, Industry, Strategy. Um, they've already, I mean, they had the My Data program running for a long time. They've got the Smart Data Review going at the moment, looking at telco and energy data, looking at that from a, can we make that into open data? In the same way with open banking. 
What's great about this is it, this, this particular report helped them look through a lens of growth rather than just switching, which has been the lens that they've tended to look at it from, which does not encourage businesses or make a business case for many businesses. How can I make my customers switch faster? Is not a compelling business case for most chief executives. And then Ofgem, who are actually doing a, an experiment at the moment around, um, around switching, actually. So there's a, no, a number of organisations in government. There's also institutions, universities, Turing Institute, for instance, that's, that's using the report. Um, OK, but what does it mean for business? I'll whip through this. There are, cha uh, there are, it creates new challenges, but it also creates new opportunities. So with all of this, if the individual actually has the ability to manage their data more effectively and use it to create value, then you create a different type of consumer. Create. Obviously, we don't. I have created a couple of consumers in my life, but <laughs> we, are, we are enabling different types of consumers and individuals who have different uh, needs, different attitudes, different demands on organisations. So how you interact with them is going to change completely and is changing already. We're going to open up competition in the market. That might be competition to incumbents and new entrants, because once they can get hold of data, and we're seeing this already in finance sector, We'll get challenger banks, fintechs coming up in the finance sector. But when you get into a recombinant space, then you've got different, different um, new entrants and existing organisations who will enter as com competitors in your marketplace and may even just cut straight across markets. So you might find that people are creating services that span across health and finance and retail, for instance. So you might be seeing a, a recut of competitive markets which is playing to the new ecosystems point on, on the right-hand side there, where you start to bring together ecosystems of services that answer actually the problems, the bigger life problems that we have of, as I say, managing my health, managing my money, managing my fitness, et cetera. Um, so there's a, there's a huge amount of shift that will happen in the, in the marketplace. And I'm really pleased because in... in Talking to businesses about this, many of our businesses in the UK understand this and are really shooting for this opportunity. <clears throat> so where, what are the specific, well, I want to say specifics. This is still quite generic because this is a generic um, presentation, but there are, there are a number of opportunities. One is to, to develop growth from uh, recombinant innovation. Sorry, let's start at the bottom. Create productivity and efficiencies, as we said before, through... Here we go. We've got some more economic terms. So um, the economies of data scope and scale. We've got more data, therefore we can do more things. We can make our customer journeys more efficient. We can make our product development, our, our processes, our logistics better, more efficient. Um, positive externalities through increased data sharing. And up in growth from recombinant innovation, you've got new products and services, which we can all imagine, I think and ecosystems, and also platform businesses that enable businesses to create completely new business models and completely new revenue streams. In a world where most, most, main, most um, existing businesses like finance or telco or energy, the margins are diminishing to very, very thin, this offers a huge opportunity to actually create completely new business models and new revenue streams. And a competitive advantage by... Um, in one instance, reducing <coughs> barriers, so you, but you, that does mean you can get into new markets and the ability to create some infrastructure. The banks are creating digital identities, so we all know that. So, you know, there's new bits of infrastructure that means that some of those players will be able to um, create completely new, um, new opportunities for themselves. I just wanted to mention this because this is... Uh, in, in the work that we've been doing and the companies we talk to, you can see... Uh, you have, companies have to go through quite a transformation to get access to this opportunity. So you have to be quite far-sighted and think quite well ahead. Now, you go back to that problem with the Gordian knot. You know, we can't see the value, but we can see the risks. How on earth are we going to be planning ahead? Some companies are, and it's really, really very encouraging. But you have to do a lot. So we've got to pin all the data together inside our businesses. So many companies have been building out APIs and using microservices to pin the infrastructure together, put in, process, in place processes and governance to enable data, data enablement, build out information businesses that actually work out what those new products and services and new business models might be, and learn how to innovate with data. Most companies think data is documents or something. They don't think it's data. 
Um, and, then, and then beyond there, build out, how do you build out ecosystems? This is a whole new business skill set around partnerships, that new value opportunities, new unique positions. This is a big challenge for businesses and most have not gone anywhere near this yet and building out these new customer solutions. So you can see that you know, we, 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 we accumulate some of the advantages as you build out some of those things into your business. It's a big transformation program. So if anybody thinks their transformation program is finished, I think the answer is not. Everybody then breathes a horrible sigh of relief, sort of, because we come to the end. And this is how we go about building our, our, the opportunities for our, for our business. So understand what's going on in context, develop the responses, build some capacity, build capacity in the business and, and build out the value. But I don't really want to ling linger on that because that looks a bit like an advert. So I'm just going to go to, oh, do you want to see that again? Yep, there you go. Um, so um, I'm going to go to here and take questions. And I think that's probably the best place to stop. OK, well done, everybody. <laughs> okay, so thanks very much for that. It was really fascinating. Um, I know I'm going to be combing through that report uh, sometime soon, probably in the next few days. Um, <laughs> come this way. Come oh, this way. Oh, I'm not in shot. There we go. Um, <laughs> so, um, if anyone has any questions, um, then uh, if you can wait till I bring you the mic, um, I'm going to use my kind of privilege and ask you a question. Oh, yeah. Great. Um, so, uh, ODI, one of the things we're thinking about at the moment is the potential for kind of new concentrations to crop up, um, you know, with these flows of data, uh, personal data flowing around. And I can sort of see from your talk areas where, you know, the people who are building the infrastructure or maybe building some of the services that um, customers might be using to manage their personal data, then we're, one of the things we're worried about is that they might be sites for new concentration. Mm. Mm. Um, is there anything you that <coughs> came up um, that can help kind of push back against that? Um, okay, so it is really well recognised that that is the case, and there's lots of conversations with economists about that, and of course with government. Um, we can imagine that if somebody like one of the gaffer, let's not name them, they, but let's say gaffer, yeah, mm -hmm. creates one of these capabilities, one of these personal data enablement environments. The concentration of data could get much greater. Mm. Of course, the the problem that they actually have is there's a big telescope on them at the moment around competitive markets. So, what are we going to do about these concentrations of data? They ca they cannot really afford to have more concentrations of data, without attracting even more co more um, examination on on competitive markets. However, you take those so that I suspect so. You know, their data transfer project that I mentioned earlier on, Google, Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn, is open. It's all on GitHub. You can see it. It's all there. And that's very much a play towards you know, opening a lot of that up. Um, and also uh, trying, to, time, trying to reach for this opportunity of being able to transfer data anywhere. So um, if, if, however, you've got a, a st startup with huge amounts of funding that might well create a concentration of data, I think that's very likely. Mm -hmm. However, many of them recognise that that issue and are already opening up their standards around it, which is really great news. It doesn't stop people from suddenly coming up with something that creates a concentration of data. But I think it calls into question, once the data is more mobile, it calls into question whether the concentrations of data are actually a competitive advantage or not. Because you, in fact, in some ways, it becomes toxic waste. If you've got a huge amount of data, you are responsible for it. And guess what? You can lose it. And guess what? People can abuse it. So actually, it's not in anybody's... Once you get there, it's not in anybody's advantage to have huge concentrations of data. The actual the competitive advantage comes in how you use the data, which is why the AI, ML piece and the skills, etc., are so critical. Fascinating. Now you've all had a chance to think about a question. <laughs> Any questions in the room? Okay, um, there we go. Um, hi there. Um, yeah, I, I first heard about this whole idea of a personal data economy a few years ago, and I think it's very fascinating and exciting. But all the evidence suggests so far that no one, the average person in the street, doesn't really care about their data. They're still happy to toss it around, even with the Cambridge Analytica scandals and so on. Um, and so I just wonder... Um, 
what kinds of products and services might the average person um, might make them excited about this and make them actually engage with the idea of taking control of their data and sharing it because at the moment you know it doesn't really seem to have flown at yep. all yep 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 i think that's a really really good point and a huge amount of discussion about that over the last nine years do you give a damn i i went and <laughs> and the answer is no uh, I was on the bottom line with Evan Davis and at the end, trick question, he said, and so of the three people who are in the room, a lawyer and a credit reference chief executive and me, uh, do you tick the boxes when you get the new service? And, and I was like, yes. Why do I tick the boxes? Because one, I don't have an alternative and two, I just want the value. Yeah? So I've, I've got kids and family and life and a business to run and people to talk to, I cannot afford not to have these services. It has to happen. So there is a piece, you're right, to link, I don't want it or I can't be bothered with what's the value because that's absolutely where it needs to go. What The million dollar question is, what value opportunity are we looking at? And we've developed out a, a model being rather weird like that, I think we, we looked at what are all the things we do in our lives where data can enable us to be more efficient and effective. We call them customer value opportunities. They're sort of the bigger problems in our lives and managing health, managing a mental, uh, mental health episode, managing a post-traumatic, managing a post-accident, managing... So all these things you have to use multiple data sets to enable us to be more efficient and effective. There's some already out there that are sort of nascent, but they just can't get the data. Once you get the data, your transport apps will be far more integrated. Your health services will be far more integrated. The way you actually manage your life will be far more enabled by, by data. But we have to overcome some of these infrastructures. So if you're looking for the million dollar answer, I, don't, I haven't got the actual answer, but I think they will come. We'll, we will start to see, we're, we're already starting to see some really interesting stuff come out of open banking, aren't we? But I think we'll start to see some really interesting stuff come out of some of the experiments. So tap into what we're going to be doing in, in January and see what we're going to be doing around that, that experiment. <coughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Um, okay. Uh, so you mentioned something about data not being documents or not being specific things. So yeah, I would really agree with that, that sound is data, yeah, video is data nowadays, um, documents, yeah, numbers, yeah. So we've got like many, many different data opportunities. Mm -hmm. Have you done any work in terms of assessing which of them are more reachable, so is it easier to work with numbers? Is it easier to work with video? Is it easier to work? I mean, we've seen things coming out from GAFA, as you're saying, mm. but so you said you did some customer maps. Would mm -hmm. there be, you know, like radius, these are mm. the more reachable opportunities. These are the things that are kind of further ahead. Yeah, no, that's a big question, huh? <coughs> because uh, in some ways what you're, wait what you're asking, I think, is, let me see if I can clarify this, but it's what's the sort of roadmap towards accessibility of different types of data? Is that what you're... Yeah. One is different types, but many people ask, what, what am I going to be able to get access to and when? And a lot of that is still stuck in just data, you know, as in documents that have been digitised, etc. Um, so we now obviously can get G GP data, Obviously, we can get open banking data. They're looking for energy and telco data to come. <clears throat> but when you start to get into artificial intelligence, I mean, sorry, artif um, augmented reality, facial recognition data, we are a million miles away from knowing how we're going to do that. And, you know, look at some of the standards work that's being done. Some of that standards work is looking at Look at how hard it was to work out what the standards are for finance data to make those things interoperable. Yeah. took quite a long time. I suspect it took more time because there's a lot of, I don't know why I'm here and I'd rather not do this because it feels anti-competitive, which might have slowed it down significantly. But there, you know, there's, we're still, we, even with data that we know is there and we understand, we're still quite a long way away from it. Data that we don't really understand very much about is still, a, I would say, a long way away. It'd be great when we get there. 
My children will see that, I think. <laughs> um, more questions? Hi there, my name is Lawrence Kay. Um, you mentioned a very important topic of um, the opportunities from you know, recombinations of different uh, bits of data. And the, the boundary of that potential is obviously determined by where that data comes from. And if you're working in one country, there's a narrower boundary. <coughs> the more countries you work in, the more p potential recombinations there are, the higher the potential value. So, you know, you could imagine that the UK has a, has a data infrastructure framework that allows, you know, people collecting data on farms in Uganda to work out new business models with people running factories in Ukraine. But in that, because, you know, you obviously talk about data ethics, you know, very coherently, there's a sort of a cultural exchange there about international trust. How do we know these people are going to use this data in the way that we expect? It's a very big question, but I just wondering if, if you have any thoughts on how to get the international trust and cooperation and cultural understanding in order to reach some of those recombinatorial opportunities that you eloquently spoke about. So, um, I just feel like I'm, I'm being disappointing in my answers. Because, the, I mean, the, this work was focused on the UK, so we never touched the international issues. And for sure, you've got an interoperability interesting conundrum i would say across across countries um ethical standards are still data, data ethics is still a long long way away <clears throat> people think that actually the uk will be an exporter of data ethics as standards um thus you you know the data ethics and innovation unit that's being set up as an arm's length government entity um and people are rushing to do that and one of the other issues around the international elements of this, and you mentioned Uganda and so on and so forth, you didn't mention China, um, where there's completely different ethical standards and completely different attitudes to what is appropriate and what is not appropriate about what people know about me, not just what people know about me, but what government knows about me and who controls and manages that data. Um, so I think we're a long, long way away. Are you looking at international work at the moment? Yeah. yeah. So it, I think, I mean, it'd be very interesting to see what you're doing on international uh, ethics and exchange. It's, yeah, you're, you're a long way away, long way ahead, rather. <laughs> so it's good to know. <laughs> didn't, I didn't see anybody that was actually working specifically in all the work we did. We, we only ever saw really, like, say, the India stack and uh, the Crossroad and Estonian, so on and so forth. They were <coughs> in country. Have you found any that are across boundaries? Do you... Have you uh, not yet. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I didn't miss anything. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Add it to the back of the 200 pages. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> any more questions? I think we've got time for one or two. Um, I'm going to do the classic trying to be a progressive chair and ask if any women have any questions. <laughs> not to put pressure on women. <laughs> okay, cool. Go for it. We're terrible at asking. I can identify as a woman if, that's, if that helps. <laughs> the beard is a giveaway, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, anything goes these days. Um, I just wonder, is, is there a possibility that the market might solve all of this problem, that uh, a startup, what you talked about, the PIMS earlier, yep. one of the PIMS might come through with an in incredible product and people just, through word of mouth, gravitate towards it and that yep. becomes the intermediary for data exchange and just, yep. you know, the market solves it. I, I, I think there's a chance. Um, if we look at the two different parts of this, one is the infrastructure enabling bit. There's a chance that somebody is going to solve at least some of that. Uh, and it's a very good chance, actually. I know a number of them, a small number, but I think they're very well positioned to do that. <coughs> so if I take that specifically, I think there are people there. Um, I also think I can envisage very well that that might well get overtaken by <coughs> an AWS an Amazon Web Services type of cloud-based service where that capability gets either bought in or reconstructed inside a large entity like that, which then starts to get us to the international elements. Um, and I can see the market migrating in that direction. And by the way, so can they. So they know that there's a short period of time where they, they might be able to solve the problem, which is why they're opening up as well, because they can then operate at different levels of value. <clears throat> so I definitely see 
that there are people who are going to sort some of those problems out. I think there are still some some elements which are going to be very hard to sort out. Standards have to be driven by somebody. And indeed, if we drive standards, we could be very competitive as a country. You know, I'm, I apologise for being very countryist on this, but that is because we got commissioned to look at the UK economy. Um, but we can actually create a really strong set of standards which will help us internationally grow. Um, if I look at the value, there are huge numbers of organisations uh, that are looking at how do, you, how do you create this new value. And they're all starving of data. And until you've got the data, it's very hard to create an app that helps you find the right clothes for your wardrobe or the right food to match your diet or the right, you know, it's just really, really hard until you've got that data. And it's really patchy and really ugly and very expensive to get access to. So, you know, they're all struggling, poor souls, with putting their tiny bits of investment into doing some pretty tough jobs. Once that infrastructure is sorted, those, those companies will flourish. So if anybody's got any investments in those com companies, hang on in there. Be fine. <laughs> um, OK, I guess one last couple of questions. Any on the Twitter? OK, well, sorry, live stream watchers, you've lost your chance. Um, <laughs> cool, so I guess it just remains for me to thank Liz. Thank you, that was really brilliant. I think there's a lot of food for thought there, certainly on the projects I'm working on. Thank you. Um, and, yeah, thank you all for coming and watching. And, yeah, tune in next time, I guess. <laughs> thank you very much. Just thank Liz. Thank you. <laughs>